family? Um, let's pray. God, meet us in the various spaces and places where we might find ourselves this morning. Bind our hearts to yours and our spirit to you and to one another, despite not being in the same location physically. Silence any voices within us but your own and make us very sensitive, not just to the sound of your voice, but to your presence with us right where we are. Speak to us in the way that we need to be spoken to. Help us to hear in the way that we need to hear, that we may transcend, that we may transform, that we may be stretched, that we may grow, that we may do this thing differently, better, that we may follow you in ways that are far more faithful and that give us access to abundant life. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we're looking at um, a lectionary passage out of the book of Ezekiel. So just a little background on the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel was um, in Jerusalem when King Nebuchadnezzar captured it in the 6th century. And so we are looking at a passage of scripture or really most, if not all of the book of um, Ezekiel is done or written while the children of Israel are in exile. And so the prophet um, would have most likely have been also considered very strange by his contemporaries. So um, this was because he received extraordinary visions and he often engaged in symbolic prophetic acts. Um, he often felt overwhelmed as most prophets were and um, do by the messages that God asked him to communicate. So you all, it can be very difficult to find this balance between the burden of the things we've been shown, the things that we know will happen if things do not change, if people do not heed advice. Balancing that reality with the reality of our own limitations um, to make things happen can be a real true struggle. And so Ezekiel wasn't necessarily considered a really great um, prophet during his time. He wasn't held um, in the highest respect until after his death. And most scholars presume that he actually died in exile. Prophetic gifts in general, but particularly gifts that manifest in the way that Ezekiel's did, can be very isolating and lonely. This um, capacity to see what will happen if people do not turn back to God, this, this calling back to God, can be a very lonely place to be. And so in the lectionary text that we are looking at today, um, we are given a glimpse into a communication between God and this prophet. Now, reading it presents some very clear prophetic words, even for us today. Do your part and you're good. Don't do your part and you'll be held accountable. But if we do a close reading, we may be able to see the nuances of the message our God weaves into this exchange. Nuances that I believe perhaps were intended um, to give to Ezekiel a new way of holding all of this stuff, um, to relieve some of the pressure from Ezekiel and all of the things um, that he was trying to balance and work through. It isn't just do your part, but it's also be clear to distinguish between what's your part and what's not. So let's read the passage and then we'll lean in. This is Ezekiel chapter 33 verses 7 through 11. And it reads as follows. So you mortal, I have made a sentinel for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked ones, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity, and their blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from their ways, and they do not turn from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity, but you will have saved your life. Now you mortal, Say to the house of Israel, thus you have said, our transgressions and our sins weigh upon us, and we waste away because of them. How then can we live? 
Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their ways and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord stands forever. So I have three very vivid memories from when I was in the second grade. One was that I was in what was called a combination class. So half the students were in the second grade, the other half were in the third grade. Very strange, but it happened, I promise. Second, it was the first and only time I can remember being there being so many snow days that winter that we actually had to go to school on Saturday to make up days. Again, for native Californians, that may be something never thought of, but it happened. <laughs> and third, it was the first memory I have of someone stealing something from me. So my parents had bought me my first pocketbook and it was a stone wash jean purse with a long strap that I could strap all the way across my body. And the first night I got it, I actually accidentally stained the bottom of it with a red pen that I put inside of it that leaked out. But I got over the disappointment of messing up my purse really early, fairly quickly, because it was on the bottom. And so, you know, I figured, hey, can't really see it if you're walking around. And so I kind of just let it go. I was really, really excited about my purse and I was so proud to walk into school the next day like a big girl with a purse. And I took it everywhere with me, y'all. I mean, that first day, I took it to the bathroom and I took it to the playground and I took it to the lunchroom. And when I was in class, I hung it on the back of my chair. And every once in a while, I just, you know, reach back and touch it to make sure it was still there. Well, at the end of the day, during cleanup, I was buzzing around like everyone else. And when we all went back to our seats to gather our things, I noticed that my purse was missing. And so I asked around, I asked people around, you know, hey, you see my purse? You see my purse? I'm becoming very visibly um, upset as they continue to say no. Tears are forming in my eyes. I knew I had left it on my seat, but I began to doubt myself because my parents had always taught me to be careful about um, accusing people of stuff without knowing for sure. And so I wanted to say somebody took my purse, but in my hesitation to accuse no one in particular, I began thinking I had maybe lost my purse. Like, did I forget and really not put it on the back of my seat? And so, um, after just one day, all this disappointment, all this anger, all this pain began to rise up and I couldn't decide whether or not I wanted to be sad or angry, angry in this moment. So my teacher finally noticed my reaction, finally noticed that I was visibly upset. And as tears formed in my eyes, she asked the class if anyone had seen my bag. No one came forward. I went home, I told my parents, I cried some more. And when I came to school the very next day, I saw my purse walked through the door, strapped across the shoulder of a classmate. I was enraged. I went up to her immediately and I said, that's not yours, that's mine, give it back. And she said, uh-uh, uh-uh, this is mine. My mama bought this for me last night. So my teacher here in the exchange, as you can imagine, walked us both outside into the hall and she calmly and quietly asked my classmate, she says, if she says, is this your purse or is this Donna's purse? And she insisted that no, her mom had bought it for her. And then my teacher said, so if I call your mom, is she going to tell me she bought that purse for you last night? Tears welled up in her eyes, but she still said yes. She said she'll tell you that she bought it for me. And then I remembered there was a way to prove whether or not this was my purse. And I said, you know what? My purse has a red mark on the bottom because my pen leaked out and stained it. And so my teacher reached over, she lifted up the purse and there it was. She had to give back what she stole. 
Now, I in no way wish to criminalize my young classmate. As an adult, I realize there are many heart-wrenching reasons why she would steal that purse. But the point here is I can see lurking in this passage a similar exchange between God and God's prophet Ezekiel. God in God's own way is saying to Ezekiel and by default to us, some stuff ain't yours. It's mine. And if you take it, you need to give it back. So let's take a look. The first thing that God suggests isn't ours is the work of salvation. The work of salvation. In the very first line of verse 7, God calls Ezekiel to face his position of limitation. So you mortal, you are mortal, as in human, one subjected to death, is not immortal in the physical sense as God, the immortal one, is. God who always has been and always will be. I personally tread very lightly around the proclamation of who will and will not be saved, who can and cannot be saved. And perhaps another day we can delve into the intricacies of the dominant culture savior complex. But for now, just for right now, God says to Ezekiel, salvation is fully in my hands, not yours. God does not place upon this prophet the responsibility of punishment, nor the responsibility of absolution. We may not have been called specifically as prophets by vocation, but I believe we are all living in times where we must all engage in prophetic work. There is so much blatant wickedness around us that we must delineate between what's ours and what's God's. To seek to perform the role of God is to fail. It is to forfeit our life and the lives of those we are called to warn. And that is what God makes clear. You are mortal. You are limited. You are not God. But that doesn't mean that your role is without power. So I've always been very intrigued by the story of the boy who cried wolf. This boy who out of boredom lies twice by saying there is a wolf in the sheep pasture. The townspeople come twice and for the life of me, I can't understand why they continue to keep him as watchman after he proves to be untrustworthy, but they do. And when a wolf actually comes, you all know the story, and he raises the alarm, the wolf has come to devour the sheep, he now calls out in warning that the wolf has come, but because no one believes him, because he cannot be trusted, nobody comes. And an entire village loses a portion, if not all, of their livelihood. What seemed like a small and insignificant job wasn't. A role that someone with little skill and experience could play had very high stakes. What was needed wasn't the ability to sing or preach everyone into the heavens. It wasn't a four, six, eight year college degree. This boy didn't even need to have the ability to fight the wolf and save the sheep. All he needed to be was trustworthy and all he needed to do was sound the alarm. One small job, very high stakes. Our obsession with playing God is rooted in a lot of things to include white patriarchal culture, but we don't have time right now to delve into those depths. But this is the point. The work of salvation is not our job. Warning that salvation is being threatened is. Despite the fact that we are mortal humans, Despite the list of our many limitations that are far too many to count, despite the fact that we are off, that we often get things wrong and every day we are in tremendous need of God's grace, despite our inability to wield the infinite power of God to be God, what appears to be such an insignificant role in the process has the weight of life or death strapped to its ankles. 
Don't mistake the limitations of your humanity as a lack of significance or power. Don't think your one vote lacks power, life or death, baby. Don't think your call to Congress lacks power, life or death, baby. Don't think your press for equitable pay lacks power, life or death. Don't think that your clear but compassionate pushback on microaggressions lacks power, life or death. We are not called to save, but to warn, to inform, to reveal, and to make known a path to life, a path away from death. But if we insist on deciding who should and should not be saved, like Jonah thinking um, we can determine who is deserving of a warning, then be prepared to heed the warning of God when God says loudly, salvation ain't yours. Give it back. Give it back. Stop trying to hold God-sized responsibility. Give back what you stole. The second thing God suggests isn't ours is the timeliness of God's word. God says to Ezekiel, whenever you hear a word from my mouth, not when it's convenient or when it's not, when you're not scared, not when it's easy or when you agree, but whenever, whenever means at whatever time on whatever occasion. <laughs> All right. So, Let's break this down. Air traffic controllers at airports do a number of important jobs to include keeping pilots informed, monitoring and directing the movement of the aircraft on the ground and coordinating the arrivals and the departures of flights. Now, the timing of all these duties is imperative to the safety of a whole lot of people. If a pilot is told to circle the airport because the runway isn't clear for landing, then the pilot must do so at that moment. The pilot doesn't have the option of saying, let me do that on the next flight, but I really need to land right now because I got somewhere to be. To do so would risk the lives of many to include the life of the pilot. The crux here is that the pilot must trust the air traffic controller to relay information the pilot needs but can't obtain on their own. The air traffic controller can see what the pilots cannot, has a scope and a purview that others don't because of where they are positioned. Just as we must be trustworthy in our role, we must also be able to trust God in God's role. But speaking some things at certain times, I'll admit, can be very scary. And in some cases, it can come at a cost. How can we know for sure is God pressing us to speak? And I think that that may be the bigger issue, right? Like this is a question I often get, like how do we know that what I'm feeling, what I'm being prompted to do is really from God? Well, it isn't always clear. I'll give you that. And um, sometimes we do actually confuse what we wish to hear with what God may actually be revealing. But this is what we have found is most helpful. Relationship with God, relationship with self, and relationship with others. Within the context of this passage, I need us to remember that Ezekiel's call was that of prophet. His gifts and experience, not only with the call, but with his proximity to and intimacy with God was a part of his process of knowing when God was at work. We humbly engage the gifts we have been given, but exercise them as often as possible to learn the patterns, to test and try, Growing in self-awareness of our own strengths and our own areas of development. Walking with others who you allow to get to know you. 
discipling and being discipled. This is one of the reasons why we highly encourage everyone to engage in small group discipleship. Because this is what we do. We process past experiences with others. We do personal reflection and we engage in continuous prayer of getting to know the voice of God, getting to know how God communicates with us, communicates with others, communicates in community. And then we are repeating that process constantly. And that is what helps us grow in wisdom and discernment, the wisdom that God gives. It helps us to know how to use it, how to access it, how to locate it, how to see it when it's rising up. Relationship and familiarity. A news anchor recently learned that she had cancer because a viewer noticed a lump on her neck during a broadcast. So the viewer had seen the same thing on her neck and it turned out to be cancer. It was something that was familiar to her. She was looking at something that was familiar. And so she reached out to the news anchor to say, I would encourage you to just go to the doctor and get checked out. She, um, the news anchor did actually go and was able to start treatment sooner rather than later because someone who had a good idea of what they were looking at Someone familiar with what they were seeing sent her a warning. A warning, y'all. A suggestion, not a demand, but an invitation to consider. She said, consider going to the doctor to get that checked out. And that's key. We may not always get it exactly right, but if what we believe God is speaking now, based upon our experience with God, our experience in community and our own intuition, and if it is a message that will lead to life rather than death, even if it's hard to hear, then it's always worth the chance to share. Do so humbly. Rarely do I say God told me to tell you. But I will say, I sense God saying, and then I invite a person to pray about it. Or when I feel prompted, I simply name what is. That was a critical incident of race or gender for me because either way, when what is being said is intended to bring life and not death, when the urgency of the message is sitting so strongly that you have to work hard to dampen it, Perhaps the timing, unbeknownst to you, is now. And all you must do is speak it clearly and assertively and with compassion. The timeliness of God's word ain't yours to determine. Give it back. Stop trying to hold God-sized responsibility. Give back what you stole. And finally, the third thing that God suggests isn't ours, is the sins of generations before us. So several close friends and family members finally convinced, convinced me to watch the series Greenleaf. And what I um, found when I began to watch it was a series written like inside the complexities of life. But one dynamic in the series that, was, that has been ongoing and consistent is the tension between the mother, May, and her eldest daughter, Grace. Now, May, throughout the series, overtly blames Grace for all the pain in the family, even the times when Grace clearly had no role to play in what was unfolded. May found a way to make Grace the guilty party. What we were seeing is um, this defense mechanism in the character of May called projection that, you know, what we um, are so ashamed of or what we feel so guilty of, we project our own seeming faults onto others as a means of um, coping and defending. It's like a defense mechanism. But the pain in this series is so palpable between the two that at times, even just watching it, I've cringed. But what we find later in the series is that the audience discovers that May's tension with her daughter doesn't actually have anything to do with Grace. It has nothing to do with what Grace has done, but is fueled by a decision May made that she regrets. A decision that her daughter 
grace reminds her of simply by being who she is. Now, I don't want to give it away for those who may wish to see it, but haven't. But here's the point. We are often made to feel as if we must carry, atone for, and hold the guilt of others. But that is not so. Notice in this passage, the voice of God goes back and forth between language that speaks about the whole house of Israel and those presumably individuals who are wicked making a choice. As I read more background on the book of Ezekiel, I discovered that the author did not hold his present contemporaries, the people he was living around in exile, responsible for the wickedness that led to the exile. In other words, the children were not blamed for the actions committed by those before that led them to exile. This is an important distinction because we have two things at play, two things, hear me well. One message is that any individual who chooses to repent and turn back to God can be saved, even if others they are connected to do not. But the second message says that though the children of Israel at the time may have been responsible for the exile of the nation, were not accountable for the actual sins of those who came before. They were still responsible, though, for the ways their actions continue to be influenced by and impacted by sin. I'm going to say that again. Very important. Okay. Even if others they were connected to, even if others you are connected to choose not to repent, you as an individual can. But the second message says that if you are in um, a family, a society, a group, a church, right, that you may um, be impacted by some of the things and the decisions that have been made before you or around you. You are not directly responsible for the actions of others, but you are impacted by those things. And you must, you must attend to the ways that you have been impacted by those things. So let's make it plain. Let's go back to Greenleaf, okay? It was not fair for May to hold her daughter responsible for the guilt she had over an action she performed. We cannot atone for the direct sins of others. However, fair or not, Grace had developed her own patterns of pain and brokenness because of her mother's past pain that led to the perpetuation of actions that she herself chose and was responsible for. The ways that her mom's past pain impacted her created her own set of actions that she did have to be responsible for. We are not responsible for the evil legacy of enslavement, but we are responsible for the ways we allow oppressions born of the same stuff as racism to reign free in our own spaces, misogyny, classism, homophobia, etc. Just as the character of grace has a responsibility to work to break the cycles of pain that her mother sin and her grandfather sin before her caused, we too must break the cycles we inherited, not by embodying the same sin that caused it or by being attentive to not embodying the same sin that caused it. You cannot atone for the direct sins of your parents or grandparents. That ain't your burden. But you do have to participate in your own healing. You do have a responsibility to help right the wrongs that still exist within the systems that were caused by those who came before. Whether it's your family or society, work must be done individually, the wicked repent, and socially, the house of Israel must release its transgressions. It isn't either or, but both and. What we are not is destined to inherit the sins of those who came before. We couldn't even atone fully for our sins. How in the world can we atone for the mama who abandoned or for the daddy who stepped out or for the uncle who creeped in at night or the auntie whose words cut like freshly sharpened knives? 
We are holding enough dealing with the aftermath of so much pain and brokenness in our country and in our families, holding more than we must. That's too much. Only God can hold all that. And God did so on Calvary. Our job is to preserve our own lives and the lives of those at risk of dying by working to stop the cycles of oppression and sin inherited from others. Internalizing the guilt of or perpetuating the sins of others isn't yours. Give it back. Stop trying to hold God's sized responsibility, y'all. Give back what you stole. The bottom line is this. We ain't God. We ain't God. <laughs> Any prophetic message from God is not about the judgment of God, but it's always, always about a call to repentance. God makes clear that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. In other words, God takes no pleasure in the death of anyone created in God's image because we are all beloved. But love doesn't mean without consequence. It means God keeps fighting to save. A prophetic message is about justice because justice is about righting wrongs and righting wrongs is about healing and healing is about choosing life and not death. If the wicked among us take heed to the call for repentance, then we are all the better for it. And if they don't, then that's on them. But if we fail to issue a warning of danger that is coming, that is ahead, if we fail to point to the alternative path, then we have become participants in the sickness that leads to death. That ain't yours. <laughs> Give back what you stole. Know the difference between what's yours and what's God's. And so we have a very good transition in this moment. As today marks a sacred practice of the church that most reminds us of who we are of God's beloved, those who need God's grace. It reminds us of who God is, the one who loves so perfectly that eventually all things will be made right. It reminds us that we are bound by love, not just to one another, but by all who courageously follow the liberating and healing path of Jesus Christ. We are a people who have become the body of Christ, extending to this world an invitation to life, not just because it's what we are supposed to do, but because we know firsthand how it feels to be loved by this God. Firsthand how it feels to be healed by this God. Firsthand how it feels to be forgiven by this God. Firsthand what it means to be consumed by the grace of this God. We return to the table to get what we need, to be reminded of who we are. We are what we eat, and there is nothing but goodness at God's table. Hope is at the table of God. Fellowship and intimacy is at the table of God. Strength to live is at the table of God. At this table is life. And so we trust that whatever we need to give to God in repentance, we can without hesitation because the one who always has and always will be is big enough to cover it all without exception. So I want us to just take a moment. I want you to take a moment. I want you to close your eyes and make silent confession to God. As God draws close, as God embraces you and frees you in the only way God can. Take a moment. Say to God what needs to be said as we prepare 
to receive the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God, our Savior and Redeemer, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We often have not loved our neighbor as ourselves or even ourselves in the way that you desire. And so we ask that you receive our repentant hearts or even those of us who desire to repent but are on our own journey in our place of pain. Accept even the desire to give up the things that separate us from you and grant to us through your table the capacity to turn away from anything and anyone who brings death that we might be free to turn towards you, the one who gives life. Bless the many tables laid before us in our various locations. Make the elements we have available un unto, um, into grace. Make them available and grant to us grace that they may become your body and your blood and give us what we need. Recommit us to your call. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was gathered with all of the disciples for the Passover meal. And um, he sat down, he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Take and eat it. And then he took the cup and he did the same thing. He blessed it and he passed it around. He said, this is the cup of salvation. My blood shed for the remission of your sins. Drank it, all of you. And then he says, I want you to do this as often as you can in remembrance of me. And so I invite you now in this moment to take what other elements of bread that you have and receive them. Take them. This is the body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. And now take the elements of the cup and receive the same. This is the blood of Christ shed for the remission of your sins. Drink all of it and receive what you need. The scripture reminds us that they sung a hymn and they greeted one another and they went out into the Mount of Olives singing. Now in lieu of us being able to greet one another in person, I invite you to do any number of things. You can write into the chat words of greeting and love to one another. Or you can send a text or say a small prayer for someone. But do this as a means of fellowship. Do this as a means of connection. Because God in this moment is instilling into us power, into us faith, into us grace, into us wisdom, into us the very things that we need. And may we recommit in this moment to be the body of Christ. In Jesus name, so it is and so it shall be.